Before I start the show this week, I'd like to ask you to become a patron of our show by going over to Subscribe Star and giving us a monthly amount, or you can go to houseofsunny.tv and give us a one-time PayPal donation. We are totally fan-funded. We really could use your support, and the more support we get, the more we'll expand the show, the more stuff we can do. We'll start to have guests. We can do some live video. To all our existing subscribers, thank you very much. We really appreciate you. You're hanging out in the House of Sunny podcast, where it's always sunny, mostly because of your host, comedian and YouTuber, Sunny Loman. Want to know what Sunny and her friends are thinking about this week? Well, here she is, Sunny Loman. Hey everybody, welcome to the House of Sunny podcast. Today we're going to update you on the coronavirus first, then we're going to talk about the State of the Union and probably the Super Bowl halftime show. We have some time there, so we can talk about pole dancing because that's Doug's favorite topic, right Doug? Mm, of course it is. Yeah, a little booty shaking, a little Why pole dancing. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? Um, I'm not gay, so. <laughs> You're a dude. Yeah, come on now. All right, so let's do coronavirus update first because I just want to be quick about that. Um, this is my new obsession, by the way. I used to watch Harry and Meghan videos back to back, and now I watch <laughs> coronavirus videos. Yeah, back we to had back. some complaints, by the way, that we, we didn't get the royal family last week. So Did we have complaints we, about that? We I, might have to do the mic drop. You know, or the, here's the thing the sound those, drop. those crazy kids are being awfully quiet. So, mm -hmm. not a lot going on. Um, they're, you know, they're in Canada. Like that, like what could that, happen? Like that matters. We can still talk about it. Nothing happens in Canada and they're in Canada. So that's the problem. But I have heard that she is going to, she wants to move to, you know, here's the thing. We all, okay, we're getting into it. Why are we getting into a Harry and <laughs> Meghan update? <laughs> Where's your sound? Now it's time for the House of Sunnies Royal Watch. Um. The only thing I know is that um, it, they have been caught making money on Instagram. Um, basically, they are promoting quote unquote charities that only give 10% to charity. So it's really like a sweatshirt company, you know, that's selling sweatshirts. Maybe. And they promoted a couple of those on Instagram, obviously paid to do it, but acting like they're charities and they're, uh, they're like promoting charities, but they're really promoting companies. They're just money grubbing now. Yeah, total money grubbing. And and but you know, with the appearance of it being like a free charitable kind of thing, which it isn't. Come on. And then the other thing is, is we knew when she said, Oh, we want to move to Canada, which is a little more palatable for British people to take because it's still the Commonwealth and Harry's the prince, you know? Sure. But we all know she wants to end up in LA. Like, duh, right? And maybe Harry of too. So they're in Canada, supposedly. Or he, will, he will not be the Prince of Bel-Air. <laughs> well, he won't be fresh, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so now apparently she's, she's starting to put out the word that, oh, they plan to move to, to be in California for just the summer, you know. Just uh, the summer. We all believe right. that. Well, why? Because they want to go back to Canada for winter? I know, right? I think they got that backwards. Very good point. Very good point. Canada's actually lovely in the summer. That would be the time that I would want to be there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, okay, let's move on to the coronavirus. Quick, quick update, you guys. Um, the official cases are at 28,000. The deaths are at 566. But recovered has like quadrupled now to 1,400. So... We've got some, we got more recovery now. It does seem to be a long ass flu. Like people really get, it's like a three week flu. That's mm. brutal, man. Yeah. Um, you know, your but biggest are problem. Are these statistics from China now? Or these where statistics are, you are from China. Um, and we don't believe them. And but. there was a, a funny glitch that someone in Taiwan figured out. The, the Chinese are keeping double numbers. I saw this. And when they go and update on their official site where they're putting in the numbers, there's like this weird glitch that happens where for a moment 
you can the see <laughs> the real numbers. It's like 10 X. <laughs> it's 10 times. So I wrote down what that was on February 1st. I'm going to give that to you. So on February 1st, apparently the real numbers in Wuhan are 154,000 uh, uh, confirmed, about 80,000 suspected, 25,000 dead, and 269 cured. That was as of February 1st. 25,000 dead? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's we do not know what's going on. And I mean, it's pretty clear that people are not getting care. There's a lot of stories. So it's it's not like that would happen here necessarily, although it could. I mean, if we're not really prepared and this were happening to us, I think we would struggle. But in the U.S., we're a little less, um, you know, we're a little more caring, I would say, than the Chinese government. And the problem is that people get pneumonia and then they don't, they need oxygen. So we could run out of oxygen. I mean, it may just be that we don't have enough supplies to deal yeah. with, uh, with right. it here even. So that's Yeah, that's the more the problem is just being overwhelmed with numbers. That's, it's that not, is the problem. Yeah. Like one guy gets it, it's not a big deal. But when all these people go to the hospital at the same time seeking the same supplies, you just can't do it. Right. That's exactly right. So, and that is a danger here even. We think it isn't, but it is. Okay. Let's hope it, you know, let's hope it doesn't come here like that, but I... It there, seems like the mood about it has changed. Like there was yeah, sort of panic. I've noticed that. We were panicky a year ago and now, I don't know what, what people know that I don't know, but the whole mood and the markets and the other sorts of mechanisms that would reflect panic and concern seem to be more, you know, sanguine about the whole thing. So I, I guess that's a good sign. I think I don't Unless know if that's a good sign or if that's the cry wolf phenomenon, which, you mm -hmm. know, when you when you live in a world where the media goes crazy about everything and and makes everything seem like, you know, a coming Armageddon, <laughs> you get a little right. bit like, uh, yeah, whatever, I'll believe it when I see it. And the problem is that I mean, if you really look at what's going on here, we've never seen anything like this. I mean, we have, but it's been 100 years. Mm -hmm. And it's devastating China right now. I think it's weird that the economy isn't reacting, like the markets aren't reacting more to the idea that I heard, a, I heard that two-thirds of the Chinese economy is shut down right now. Well, I've also heard that the Chinese government has been intervening in their markets. And God only knows, it's so hard to disentangle you know, where capital's coming from, if they're uh, intervening with billions and billions of dollars, um, you know, they could be manipulating their own market to keep things going. Um, we just don't know. No one knows. Well, what so I'm I, hearing from experts in terms of just the virus is that this isn't containable and that it's just, you know, probably in the West, it'll be a slower creep, um, but that it's going to be endemic. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be like the flu. It's just going to be something that we get. And, you know, eventually we'll probably have a vaccine. Um, not everybody gets it at once. Obviously, not everybody gets the flu. Um, I've never had, I haven't had the flu since I was a kid. What? Yeah. Come on. I'm not, I mean, is that weird? Yeah. I've, I thought have, everybody gets it. I have colds, but I, I've never had, I haven't had the flu since probably high school. So, you know, but, but there's herd immunity in the U.S. for the flu. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if, if people get the flu, it's not like everybody at once is going to get the flu and then we all end up in the hospital like what's happening in China. So anyway, what well, I'm really starting to be very sad for the Chinese people. <laughs> this is really crazy. I watched a video of New Zealand or Australian nationals being pulled out of Wuhan. And so there was a flight and, and there was video from the airport. And there was this young Chinese boy who obviously has, for whatever reason, New Zealand or Australian citizenship, saying goodbye to his grandparents. Ugh. And he's like, hug, you know, he, he was probably like a late teen. And he's hugging his grandparents goodbye and holding their hands and they're all just looking at each other. And you can tell that what they're thinking is, I may never see you again. 
Yeah, that's heartbreaking. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, that's really harsh. All right. So let's move on to something more positive. I don't really have much more to say about the coronavirus today. Just the latest. Nothing nothing really big happening there. There was a rumor that the virus may have escaped from a weapons lab. That that was a big story. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, I mean, I I don't I don't, I don't know. Maybe. All right. The other I'll talk about I'll talk about that with some of my quote unquote friends online. <laughs> the other thing is uh leave that to darker corners of the internet. The only other interesting thing is that it's popped up on three cruise ships, which is horrifying. We talked about that. Yeah. Never go on a cruise ship. Never go on a cruise ship. If you do I've had actually I haven't had the flu, but I've had the norovirus, which is what usually pops up on these cruise ships. Mm -hmm. And I I went to Christmas at my my brother's house and nobody told me what was going on in the house or I just never would have gone. And I, I showed up and everybody had already had it. And like, you know, it's a house full of my family and like my niece was still sick with it, but everyone else had had it and recovered, but you know, very germy. And of course I got it and my daughter Ooh. got it who was one years old Oh, no. And then we kind of stayed there and recovered from it before coming home so as not to give it to her dad and, and the nanny and stuff. We, we just kind of hung out at my brother's house for a couple extra days. And we flew home and everybody got it. Like that's how contagious it was. We were contagious after. Mm. And how do you know everybody got it? Well, I'm saying that her dad got it, the nanny got it, like oh, oh, the oh, whole oh. house got it. I thought you meant the plane got it. The norovirus was is a brutal, brutal freaking thing to get. And that's what usually goes around those cruise ships. So, yeah, no thanks. And I wonder if I'm immune now. I hope I'm immune because I don't ever want to get that again. Okay. So we had a State of the Union, um, which was very interesting. I cried seven times, mostly because I'm a total you know, sappy person as a, mm -hmm. as a mom, I've become a total sap, but I'll tell you those seven times I cried and then we'll get into some other details about it. But did you cry at all watching it? Well, only when I saw Nancy Pelosi's face close up <laughs> and it was a shriek of horror. She's just Okay. We'll talk about what, what happened there. <laughs> Everybody knows she ripped up the speech after. Um, okay. So the first time I started, I didn't expect to cry. I am a little, I would say, I'm a little sensitive. I probably cry over stuff a lot, hmm. especially parent-related stuff. Like yes. whenever there's a child that's struggling, oh my God, that's all it takes. I'm in tears. I've gotten that way now, now that I've had kids for so long. I, I definitely have gotten that way about kids. Any family, father, son type stuff. Yeah. But... But other than that, I, I don't really, I don't get too emotional. Yeah. Okay. Well, the first time I got emotional was when he called out the Top the gun. real Venezuelan Advertise. president. You know, when he said when, that. Here's yeah. the real Venezuelan president. And like, he had the guy stand up and they cheered him and they said, we want you to know the American people are with you. That was the beginning of crying for me because that was really... <laughs> touching and i just really it's so sad what's happening in venezuela just like in china i mean the misery you know yeah and death and maduro the dictator and and they voted for this guy and and he's not so great he's like a socialist but at least he's not a um you know he's not a communist and he's not a he's not as bad um, and you got to take your baby steps they're not voting for a thomas jefferson right um, just someone that doesn't kill people someone, <laughs> and round people up and make them eat dogs. Someone that lets a little bit of capitalism work so that <laughs> they can actually freaking eat so that people have food. Uh, the second moment that I cried was when they honored that hundred and some year old Tuskegee guy. Yeah. And, Tuskegee Airmen. And McGee. gave him a, uh, gave him a promotion to general. And I was just tearing up about that like crazy <laughs> and of course his grandson was there which is part of what made it emotional for me and I thought this was such a smart move on Trump's part because he has this young really great looking kid 
and he's saying this the this kid's dream is to be in space force and we're all like okay yeah that's cool way to go yeah cool and then they're like space because force. his grandfather is a tuskegee airman yeah and then i was like oh my god he just made space force the coolest thing ever yeah man and there's been all this like teasing about space force and the camo and stuff and and he just made it cool. <laughs> Trump just blew by that and made it super cool. Anyway, I was crying about that. And then when he gave the scholarship to the young black girl. Mm. I mean, I know what it's like to be a young, smart kid in an inner city public school that sucks. And so that really yeah. made, that, that made me tear up. She could join Space Force, too. Well, now she can because she's going to get to go to a school that doesn't destroy her. Right? Yeah, maybe we should send all the inner city kids to space. I don't even understand that. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, yes and just, I'm trying uh, to yes and that. I have no idea. <laughs> no, it's just it was just a thought, like a program to help the kids. <laughs> Give them some camo and shoot them out to space. <laughs> yeah, that's space our force. new that's our new program for the. For they the can poor just or, they can orbit. <laughs> they can orbit. <laughs> oh, that sounds more Chinese than American. I don't know. Yeah, that does. More Venezuelan. More of a Venezuelan thing to do. All right. Um, Sorry. All right. So the girls, the girl gets the scholarship. Girl gets the, the young black girl gets the scholarship because she goes to a crappy school and she's been trying to get into that school choice. And I don't know if you've seen some of the footage of those lottery that the lotteries that they have for the good schools. Mm -hmm. And then, and the parents, all, and they're all black. All these black parents are in there with their kids hoping, you know, this is like New York or something, hoping their kids are going to get into the, the handful of good schools that, you know, have a, they take a couple dozen kids a year and they're all sitting in these big waiting rooms and they're calling out the kids who win and everybody's in tears everybody's in tears. The ones who win are in tears. The ones who lose are in tears. It's like, oh, there's God. something really wrong with government education. Look at this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You have to win to get to go to a good school. And, and by the way, at the same point in the speech, the Democrats are sitting on their hands. They're looking at their fingernails. They were looking at the ground. Nancy Pelosi's like, shaking her head, ma doing weird mouthing things like she's scholarship for the inner city kid they just sit there yeah that was disgusting yeah we'll get into that in a second but and okay so keep at, going so you're at number four Are you number, number four, four uh was rush and and it was ah, because rush yeah. was so surprised and you know he just got lung cancer stage four the guy knows he's probably gonna die you know yeah and you wrote something on Facebook under the Rational Capitalist that, page that, that I thought was really good. So I'm just going to read that, if that's all right. Oh, sure. In the 1990s, because people have been saying, like, why should Rush get this? Can you believe that? I yeah. mean, let me just say. Yeah, this was just red meat for the base and how dare they. Yeah, meanwhile, Ellen DeGeneres got the same freaking award. I mean, give me a break. Uh, Rush gross. is way more important than her. Robert De Niro got the award. Oh. Right? I mean, Rush Orf. Limbaugh did some did something amazing. And in my opinion, it promoted free speech in this country. So it wasn't just, you know, like someone was sneering, oh, he's just a talk show host. Actually, he's a little bit more than that, I think. A little bit more important than that. And I think, you know, what you wrote was really good. I'm going to read that. Um but it really was just a response to all these people criticizing this award, which let's, let's say that I, I don't want to say, well, Ellen DeGeneres got it. So it's fine that he got it. I actually think he deserves it. Right. I, I don't think just because other entertainers got it, that it's okay that this and that our entertainer got it or something like that. I think Rush Limbaugh is more important than just some average entertainer. Oh, totally. He's one of the and, more important political figures of the late 20th century. Right. Right. And with his show, he, we got to remember the context of there's no internet. There's only mainstream media and like, you know, cable news. And there's not even really Fox, I think, at this point. And he's running a radio show where people can get news that isn't being spun by a bunch of lefties. He's the only one. He's the only voice. 
besides a couple of newspapers. So that's, that's the context. And also he created a genre which has exploded the, you know, the right wing news talk radio. So all of this promotes free speech and news and information. And, you know, I think it's great. And I think he does deserve it. And here's what you wrote. In the 1990s, during the Clinton regime, I love that you call it the Clinton regime. <laughs> you caught that, huh? <laughs> and as the internet was in its infancy, the only major outlet for conservatives in the country was Rush Limbaugh, and to some extent, the Wall Street Journal. His bravado and unapologetic style, yeah, that's really important too. It, it's like pre-Trump, the only person out there who wasn't like a total sappy yeah. establishment totally right-wing hack maybe newt gingrich was also like that but he he was so such a compromiser in actuality or professorial you know or academic like bill buckley like that type of republican yeah as opposed to like a cool macho in your face yeah. um unapologetic unapologetic yeah, um, so bravado, style. unapologetic style was the most influential force on the right, and he pioneered the conservative talk radio medium as others followed in his footsteps. One day he read from John Galt's speech on his show to his millions of listeners, and it gave me hope that we had a chance. This guy is a genius, an indefatigable defender of American values, and a real-life hero. He is a real-life hero because he did, you know, think what it takes to do something completely new that no one has seen before and just keep going. Yeah, because every people, day. Yeah, because people didn't go, oh yeah, great idea, Rush, here's a radio show. <laughs> here's, a, here's a syndicated national radio show for three hours. Like, that's not how that happened. And, and so just as a personal example of somebody who, and, and anybody really famous has done this, you know, I mean, you, somebody said, well, why don't you give Howard Stern the same medal? First of all, like Rush, we're talking about ideas and politics and news and free speech. But I think what Howard Stern did was actually big, too, in a way. I mean, he also had to do, you know, he wanted to do a talk show instead of a music show. And people thought he was crazy. Yeah. So. Right. But he, I mean, this is out of whole cloth. I mean, here comes who, you know, if you had said, hey, I want to do like a three hour talk radio show and I'm going to trumpet conservative politics in a really brash, you know, unapologetic way. Um, give me uh, millions of dollars for that, please. Yeah. You know, people, I'm sure they laughed happen. at him. And he kept going, and he was just through his force of his own personality. I mean, not and only just, did they not give him money, they he got fired. <laughs> You know, well, and then, then they went after him because the liberals, despite owning all the major networks, all of cable news, all the print outlets and the universities and Hollywood, that wasn't enough. This little talk, you know, this little radio show guy, you know, is getting popular. Can't have that. Right. So they they tried to How dare you be the, on the right and have confidence. I think that really scares them. And I think that's oh, why they hate yeah. Trump. Yes, that. Yeah, if you think you're right, it's one thing to be on the right. It's another thing to think you're right or to be confident about your own opinion. Yeah. And and they went after him with the fairness doctrine. That's they were why trying they hate to Ayn Rand talk too. Radio. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they but went he, after him with the fairness doctrine. Yep. But and then, then they, he, the, the funny I'm thing sorry. is, is when they do it, it doesn't work. Nobody listens to like long form leftist radio. Yeah, they tried that. Uh, was it Voice of America no, or it's something like, a, like that? It was America something, but. Yeah, it, it was, and it America. failed abysmally. And it was because, you know, the, you know, you could get new, it was the only place really to vent because, you know, you were mad about something going on politically and you couldn't turn on the news. You couldn't turn on the network news. You couldn't turn on cable. There was nowhere to turn right. to hear your view being put out for more than like five people. And you turn him on and it was just like a different universe. And, and he was funny and he was entertaining at the yes. same time as being unapologetic. And so all of a sudden, and, and his success then spawned a cottage industry. There, All these conservatives started creating radio shows all over the country and it really spread. And, you know, that was what became, you know, the right wing blogosphere and the Internet and 
um, you know, people were researching these issues and you started finding places all over where you could finally get news from a right perspective. And he, he did that. He did it. Right. You know, so I, I think he is absolutely a hero. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. He's a hero. Yep. And I'm, I'm really sorry that he's sick. And, and so when they gave him that and the look on his face, I burst into tears. (laughs) So yeah. And now, so that's understandable. Number, that's number four. And the last three are all my mama, my mama tears. Uh oh. The last three. Because there's no way I would have cried at this stuff if I wasn't a mom. Because I just like anything to do with children being sad. I'm like in tears. That's it. I'm done. Number five, two year old premature girl. You know, now, now two. Born at 21 weeks, you know, so of course I'm thinking my baby and how I felt about my baby. (laughs) And then the mother, she's holding the two-year-old and she's keeping it together. And then all of a sudden her face breaks and she Mm. starts to cry. And that's when I lost it. I'm like, oh my God. (laughs) Okay. I relate way too much to that mother and how horrifying it would be to have a 21-week baby and then Mm -hmm. dealing with the idea that she could die, you know, every day after that for like a month, you know? Yeah. It's horrifying. Um, number six, dead soldier's letter to his son. Uh, Kill me. Yeah. That's not good. I can't handle that. That was a little too much for me. Actually. I wish he hadn't done that. And then the boy was there, you know, now older and Oh, forget it. Number seven, um, when he reunited that deployed soldier with his family and his two little kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was sad. Well, I was just going to say, we can get into this in a minute, but my sadness about the the soldier and his child was, why is that soldier there? Yes. You know? and, and, Such pointless you know, death. And I wish, you know, again, we could talk about this, the content of it in a minute, but that was one of the things that I think we need to push back on, you know, of, of all the great things, but we can talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. That's seven times. I mean, I don't think I remember crying at a state of the union address. So that was uh, kind of extraordinary. I know that those moments are meant to be tearjerker things and to play with my emotions. And that normally kind of pisses me off actually. I find the whole, the guy in the stands thing very irritating. Mm-hmm. I find that whole uh, tradition stupid. I don't know when it started, but we should end it and we should end all the freaking applause. You know, I, I kind of long for something a little more um, serious. I feel like it's all political theater and it drives me crazy. However, it did, it did its job. It made me cry. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, because I, you know, there's, there's sort of like two hats I wear with this stuff, which is, and it, and it's a function of what's a tactical priority for us right now. And so on the one hand, there's the tactical priority of fighting the left, because it's not like there were a bunch of Thomas Jefferson sitting on the other side. Otherwise, you know, there's a, there's a lot to push back on in a speech like this. And the whole theater, like you just said, is absurd because why do we have the central government that's so important to our lives, you know, and why, why do we have this kind of court, um, almost like King who's bestowing these gifts upon the populace, you know, like I'm giving you a scholarship and I'm doing this for you. And, um, you know, we, the central government shouldn't be a feature in our lives like this. So on the one hand, I'm saying, God, this is just awful that we've, we were at the state where we even care about what these people are doing. Um, that's one hat. And I, you know, we can push back on the, the progressivism I, I of some feel, of his causes. I feel toyed with, I feel like, you know, <clears throat> he, like, it's just so contrived. 
the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, oh, okay, now we're like checking the diversity box and we're checking the, yep. you know what I'm saying? And yep. I, yeah. I just like, don't stop, stop fucking toying with me and people. And, but he has to do it. Well, um, there's so, so, so there's like that, you know, and we, we can, t we should talk about that in a minute to push back. But on the other hand, the fact that there is this tactical priority in front of us, which is that's right, that the left is so vile right now and right. so awful that, you know, here you had this contrast of an American president who could not be just sensibility wise and just style wise and message wise could not be further from where the left is at right now in terms of them hating America and hating everything that we stand for and thinking everything we do is wrong and that the American people are stupid and disgusting and whatever. And here's this guy who had an amazingly optimistic outlook on not just the economy, but just the whole, and, you know, I had quoted on my page the last yeah, we're few gonna paragraphs. Yeah, we're going to get to that. We'll and, get to that. you know, just, I don't just get the, into whole, that right away. The, whole, the whole message. So in other words, the you know on that on that level it was fantastic and a fantastic um uh counter to the leftist uh nihilism that pervades our culture today and for that it was it was heroic speech on the other hand you know there's all these other bigger picture things but i don't think that that's the big focus at this point in time yeah. i think it's more the optimism yeah that's a really good point and 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 I, we are in a war. We really are in a war with these people. If we want, we either get socialism or we have to fight. And this is, this is our general and he's a fighter. And part of that is marketing. And part of that is, you know, trying to, well, I think he is just as a person, I think he's more optimistic and he does care about, um, I, I actually believe that that part is sincere. Yeah. I think he does love the country and, you know, and his, and he, he's a, a sort of, we can do it kind of person. Um, obviously he is with what he's achieved. And I thought the speech overall was excellent. And I know he's got like Stephen Miller as kind of a speech writer or whatever, but I felt that this one was really in his voice. And I think that means that probably they're getting better at writing for him. I felt that of all his kind of red speeches, this one seemed more Trump like and natural. Um, and yet when you read it, it's really smart. So I don't know, I thought uh, I, I overall really liked it. I liked, you know, that I that it moved me was I think good because it kept me engaged. And I think that that's what it does for other people too. So I did have some pro policy issues with it, which we'll get into. And then, and then we'll get into that last bit that was, to me, he just celebrated American culture, what is America, what it is to me, and our history and our shared culture. He celebrated that in the last three paragraphs of his speech. And we're just, I'm just going to play it and we're going to talk about it in a little bit because I, I think that's... That is, to me, the clash between the side I'm on and the other side. Right, and that they actually exactly. hate that. So that the, they hate everything I freaking love. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's really like on the ground today because all the criticisms that we'll have of him and just the whole structure of the federal government, which is not something he invented, um, you know, that's like a long term problem right, right now you have to stop who's in the trench in front of you and you've got to stop the bleeding. And that means having a strong pro American figure, even if we, you know, can disagree on some of these other points. Um, he is such a counterweight to yeah. what's going on. And he reminds us of that, that we, you know, and, and he's unapologetic and, that's exactly what you need right now to to just buy us time. And then, you know, look, if we had a bunch of Trumps and Thomas Jeffersons and these kinds of people, 
you know, we could have the policy debate, but we don't. We have Trump and some people, and then we have Ilan Omar, and we have AOC and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Schumer and people like, I mean, these are vile, corrupt, disgusting, evil people. And right now, I think putting the message out, this optimistic kind of pro-American message will win the election. Right. Um, and, and, and get us time. And, and it's, and do you, I wanted to mention this because I think, I think that this election is going to be like 1984. You think it's going to be and a landslide? I do, because I, I think that, and I don't know if you remember this, Sonny, but in, so 1980, right, Reagan, Reagan wins, and we, we came out of that Carter malaise, which was just a horrible time in our country. You know, the hostage crisis every day. It was the just lines miserable. lines at the gas stations. And when Reagan won... There was a liberal hysteria. Now it wasn't ampl- it wasn't able to be amplified by social media because there's no internet. But it, to the extent that you could amplify a kind of cultural hysteria on the left, it was there. There was it was it's happening in music and like punk rock. There was a reaction to it, and there was this sort of like remember the Sex Pistols and they hated Thatcher and they hated Reagan. They thought yeah. they were going to nuke the world, and you know it, it, it was all this hysteria. My parents were leftists, so I, I kind of saw this in our own house. They were crazy about it, and in a way that I see the left crazy about Trump. Well, it was funny because 1984 comes around, and the hysteria sort of died down. Um, and all of a sudden things were better. Things were just better. The whole yeah. country seemed to be prospering. Unemployment was down. The economy was doing well. And there was a different mood. And Reagan won every state well, <laughs> except, except Minnesota, Minnesota, where Mondale was from. And he literally, I mean, if there's, a, I think it was, I think like Mondale got what, 13 electoral votes. I mean, it was as much of a landslide as there could be. And I kind of think we're headed towards that again. I really do, unless the economy falls apart in the well, next we nine Well, we might months. be because it isn't just about do people like Trump, but it's about do people like the other candidate and will they come out and vote for the other candidate? I don't think people, I don't think the, maybe I'm wrong and I'm in a bubble. I know there are a lot of people who hate Trump with so much passion that they're going to come out and vote against him. But I don't really think that number's that high. I think, you know, the average Democrat isn't very motivated. But there was this Reagan Democrat in the middle, because we know that the bases are, are entrenched. You know, there's a, there's a percentage of the left that's going to hate whoever the Republican is with passion and vice versa. There's these people in the middle though. And if you watch them and their reaction to some of this, that, and I, you probably peruse this after the state of the union and Nancy Pelosi ripping it up and the, and and the fact that they were sitting on their hands through this, I I heard uh, there was a C-SPAN call in, and Democrats were calling in saying, "I'm never voting Democrat again. This was childish. This was immature. These people obviously hate our country. I can't believe they didn't at least applaud, you know, when you know some of these things were coming out. You know, we don't hate America, you know, blah blah blah. And James Carville came out um, yesterday and had a hilarious. Um, message for the Democrats basically saying, what the hell are you people doing? Did he really? Uh, um, yeah, he said, um, he goes, he goes, we're, you're talking about people voting from a jail cell and not having a border? He goes, we're trying to get votes in northern Wisconsin and western Pennsylvania. He's like, let's try and be relevant here, people, you know, yeah. in a southern accent. And so they're a mess. Yeah, and they're I, a mess. I, I mean, and, and look I, at what happened in Iowa. They're a mess. They're a total mess. Which, by the way, you did post a thing, too. The app that failed in Iowa is like a George Soros company or something. Yes. Honestly, these people are so corrupt. <laughs> oh, I'm so sick of it. All right. So, well, I hope you're right. I hope there's a landslide. Um, back to the State of the Union. Nancy yeah. Pelosi ripped it up at the end. There's a There's a picture now out that shows that she had pre-ripped the pages. What? So that she could stand up and make like a theater show of it and not and not struggle with it. Uh. <laughs> so while she was sitting there, she was pre-ripping the pages to be ready she's for like, her for her show moment. She was picking at it. Honestly, I think she's losing it and I think that it was it was a sign of lower confidence in her 
and I, you know, because I think she's being crowded out in her own party. I think that she did, impe- you know, she obviously did impeachment kind of against her better judgment. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it was dumb. It, it has led to uh, better poll numbers for Trump than yeah. before. It has exposed the Bidens to, you know, indictments, basically. And also it's destroyed Joe Biden's campaign. Yep. Um, so what exactly did that achieve? Like nothing good <laughs> for the Democrats. And she knew it. She's like, we don't, we should not do this. And this radical base forced her to do it. And so she did it. So I don't think she's feeling very confident in her position anymore. And um, then you got Trump just poking her too. I, you know, I think she's kind of losing it because that was really crazy, ripping it up. That was It nuts. was crazy. That was crazy. Because there's really no upside. And I can see doing that. If When I was a kid, I might do something like that, just out of rage, not thinking about the consequences. But for an older person who's posing as a statesman, um, much less the Speaker of the House, to not know, to, to not be in touch enough to know that, like, the people in the middle of the country are not going to react to that well. You know, they're just not. I mean, just to not be aware enough to say, look, no matter what I think, there's a lot of people in this country that love this guy. And, you know, I can't do something like this. It just well, doesn't so, look it good. Just shows, it shows lack of control, which I don't think people like it. It's kind of like you get a, a spidey sense about people and it, it definitely makes you go, what? You know, <laughs> she- yeah, like if you're if you work at a business or something and like the boss or someone, some someone who you work with comes in and like goes crazy, yeah, has like an outburst. You're like, <laughs> you're like oh. uh, things are, yeah. is everything all right? Like and, and then you just <laughs> exactly. lose a little respect for that person. Like in that moment, there's like a, a chipping away of respect. Yeah. And so I think it was that kind of moment for her, a, a very, very bad moment for her. Do you think Donald Trump snubbed her on the handshaking? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Do you think that was also petty and childish? No. Why not? Be- Isn't it a similar move? No, because, you know, I don't think Andrew Johnson, when he was impeached, uh, was shaking hands with them because he, okay, here, here's why. He gave us speech. I don't know if you saw this, Sonny. Uh, he just gave a speech. It might have been today, actually, at the National Prayer Breakfast. And so he's sitting there. Uh, Mike Pence is up there on the dais, and Nancy Pelosi was there. You should go. Everyone should go watch this. In the first few minutes, though, he, for him, this was a little different for him. And I'm, I'm getting around to answering your question about the handshake. He He basically said, in pretty stark terms, that these people, meaning Pelosi at all, really came after him to try and destroy him. And he said they really hurt the country. And he said they had no regard for the country. They came after me to destroy me. And they've put our country through a lot. And he said, and this was really interesting because this was aimed at Pelosi. He said, I don't like people who use their faith to justify doing what they know is wrong. And he said, I also don't like it when people say they're praying for me. Yeah. When I know it's not so. And you know, she's been out there with this quasi-religious, I'm praying for the president and all this nonsense. And he, he was pissed. Yeah. And this is unlike, you know, usually he's kind of like jokey, like, ah, these crazy nuts, you know, these wacko Democrats. This was personal. You could tell when he was at this prayer breakfast and he was giving this little speech and he was aiming this at her. He was saying, you really came after me in a way that's different than just normal politics. You were trying to destroy me and my family. Yeah. And and then you were saying that you were praying for me, which is condescending and patronizing. And yeah. so with all that in mind, in hindsight, I I think it was appropriate because I think I I think he's in the right. Yeah. And I don't think it, it didn't weird. come off to me I as mean, the, the amount of damage that they the amount of harm they've tried to do him personally, literally like like um, the Russian collusion thing was, I mean, that, 
They that, were calling that treason. Well, and that's a hangable offense. Not just that, but arresting his colleagues, his lawyer, his, you know, anyone involved with him and making people not want to get involved with him, um, investigating his family members. And I, yeah. I, it was very creepy and very scary. I mean, when you have the whole might of the federal government and all that money and all those people and the whole FBI and all their tactics and, you know, when you have that against you and your family, that's scary. So, only the president, only a president could have withstood this. Only um, a, nar you know, only this president, because I've said this before. Even Ted Cruz, who I regard as sort of tough and whatever, he would have folded. <laughs> like there's just, he, I, I, I don't know what you do. And then the other thing too, if you don't stay in office, they'll they'll indict you. Yeah. So he's got to win 2020. You know, well, this was before before they, um, you know, concluded the investigation and stuff. Anyway, yeah, I agree. I mean, she shouldn't have even tried to shake his hand and pretend like, oh, it's just politics as usual. You know, we're gonna be a little rough in public and then behind the scenes we'll shake hands. She stormed out of meetings at the at the White House. She's done all kinds of really nasty stuff, gone after his family, gone after him personally. Yeah, she shouldn't even try to shake his hand. Um it, it is disingenuous. Anyway, okay. Yeah, that was a bad move. I, I think that's gonna that's gonna further push people into Trump camp. So I, th I think that that's that is your analogy of the boss or the or the person at work who loses control <laughs> is perfect. That's what it looked like to me. Okay, um, so let's move on to just crit. You know, some cr I've got a couple criticisms of the speech, and then, but one thing that really st that I that stuck struck me as great, even though a lot of people on our side will say, "Oh, this is too governmenty. It's not enough. Whatever." But he made two points about education. One was, he said school choice for everybody. And then the other one was vocational training back in the high schools. Yeah. And both of these things are important to us because it breaks the monopoly that the left has on indoctrination. Yes. School choice is an obvious reason why it does that. But the vocational training is stopping people from going to college. <laughs> yeah. Hundred thousand percent. Yeah. Agree with so you have people who get out of high school and then they go do a trade. They don't go to college and they shouldn't go to college. These are people who really never should go to college anyway. They do a trade. You can be smart and be in a trade. It's not a bad career. It's a great career and it pays well. And there's a, sh there's a skilled labor shortage in this country, um, as Mike Rowe tells us endlessly. So, but it keeps you away from those leftist professors. And this is exactly the one size fits all socialist Soviet man that the left tries to create in these indoctrination centers of the universities where one size fits all. Everybody goes to college to go through the mill yep. to get to get your re-education training and how awful and evil America is. And then you become a poetry major and then someone else is going to pay for this uh, or poetry well, major. Then, that, the that's too honest. Like, oh, uh, ethno studies major or whatever Something. these and and then you have debt thing. and and then you know so now you need the government to help you with your hundred thousand dollar debt bill and and it's endless right i mean the way that it sort of catches people and and causes them to become socialists and this is why we're seeing what we're seeing so to me this is like a very long-term smart initiative so that was good yeah, because it fits within the framework of what could be done. Like we could all argue, hey, we need private education. We need to get the government out of schools. We've got to end government grants to college students and government subsidized loans. And, you know, I don't know that that's going to happen tomorrow. But like pushing to something like vocational training yeah. is like a huge message. And it's also very practical. You know, how many kids do you know that they did, you know, they shouldn't be taking, they shouldn't even really be in high school, maybe up to 15 or 16, yeah. but they're not interested. They're 16 years old. They're driving a car. These guys want to work, right? They want to make money. They want to get into the trades. They want to start doing stuff and yeah. to infantilize our children and keep them in these college education um, path uh, and, and just waste the prime years of their life and create depression and anxiety because there's a sense in which 
I think a lot of these people think they're failing if they're not aspiring to this um, model of what the government's telling you you should be in order to be successful. That's not success. You know, success is being responsible for yourself and doing what you're passionate about or what you want to do and what you're good at. It's very hard to take away an entitlement, but if you can make the entitlement irrelevant, that is maybe one way to get there. Yeah. Um, so if you can divert people from college, then you have less of a student loan problem. Um, you know, you have less of an indoctrination problem. It's, you know, so I thought it was good. Then he spoke about medical care. And this is where I feel like I just really want him to do better on this. And I think he's never been good on health care. You know, no, he came in and he was supposed to do repeal and replace. That didn't get done because thank you, John McCain, you jerk. <laughs> May you fucking rot in hell for your vote against repeal. Um, so that didn't happen. Then we got a Democrat House. So there's not really much that can be done anyway until that changes. However, he's never even really postulated anything great. Um, he's never put forth a bill really. I mean, it, I thought that it kind of spoke to his lack of, um, organization in the early days, but I think it also is, ju this just isn't one of his important issues and I don't think he's great on it. And I also think the right, for whatever reason, it's not a top priority anymore. Like when the tea party happened, it was a top priority and now we've just kind of like let it go. But if you talk to anybody, anybody, you know, Democrat, Libertarian, Republican, whatever, every single person I know is suffering under health care. Yeah. And the way health care sure. is today. And I think we're all kind of resigned, like, oh, we're just going to get single payer. That's just coming now because this is so bad and it's not sustainable. What do we do? And we can't get repeal. And it just seems like an impossible task to fix it. But we can't keep living like this. We cannot keep paying this much money for health care. Right. It's bankrupting everybody. Um, you know, it's like dub my my healthcare premium is double my car payment. It's a mortgage, you know, for for a small house. Oh my god, it's it's yeah, it is a mortgage. And then I pay cash on top of that for a lot of stuff because it doesn't cover as much as it used to. And I'm battling them all the time for you know, and I'm sick, so that's part of the problem, but Yeah. I was sick before this damn thing went into effect and I didn't, so I had a pre-existing condition and it was not this bad. <laughs> so um, I'd rather go back to the old days when it was difficult having a pre-existing condition. It was easier than this. Okay. Yeah. I have so, to admit, I, I shut him off when he started talking about healthcare because I thought it was really disingenuous. And I also don't like the fact that he has dug in on pre-existing conditions. Well, I was just going to say that. So the two things that he mentioned, he said he would always protect pre-existing conditions. Now, he doesn't explain what that means, but I understand why we need to say that because it is like the situation that I'm in now. If I were dropped from my insurance, which I would be if, if Obamacare were repealed, like everything would change again and we'd have to get a new policy, right? Mm -hmm. I would be in big trouble. Like who would insure me? Nobody. Right. And I need it more than anybody else because I'm actively using health insurance right now to stay alive. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Um, all of us with pre existing conditions are so screwed. And you have to do something for us because you created this problem. You can't kill us all by just yeah. dumping us now onto an open market with no pre existing uh, condition mandate. So, something has to be done for us. I don't think it needs to be the man that you mandate that insurance cover pre-existing conditions. I'd like to see something else, a temporary measure to help us during the transition. It has to be done. I mean, what are you going to do? It has to be done. So I, I get that he's throwing a bone to people like me, but I'd like to know what that means. And it shouldn't mean the mandate. It shouldn't mean the mandate. There's other ways to do it, you know? Well, the, the problem economically is that the essence of insurance is discriminating against pre-existing conditions. I mean, that's what insurance is. If we could all, you know, go get insurance once our car is wrecked, no one would buy insurance. So the whole point of insurance is, you know, pooling risk. And then, you know, if something happens to someone, they get paid. So 
the the fact that we're even calling it insurance is somewhat disingenuous. If you cover pre-existing conditions, it's really a kind of a pseudo welfare program where you know we all pay in an amount and then everybody's covered. But it's more of like a welfare program and a tax than it is, and it's administered by these healthcare bureaucracies. And so I, I you know, we got to change the whole rhetoric about it. And the fact that he he's not a policy guy and now. I'm also going to put on my central government hat again and say, this isn't all on Trump. I mean, where the hell is the Congress? Where are all the genius right, legislators? Agree. They're the ones who are supposed to be figuring this out. This is not all on the – the president is not like a philosopher king that knows all. Yeah, I agree. His, he, he's an executive. He's not a king. He, and he's he, not supposed to yeah. be a legislator. He's not I mean, supposed the legis- to – right. They're supposed – Congress is supposed to be doing this. So it isn't his fault, but the president can lead things – Absolutely. And, and push for things. He promised repeal. We haven't gotten it. That is a campaign promise that he broke. He broke it because Congress wasn't with him and he wasn't he wasn't really a bulldog on it. Right. He didn't expend. He could have made that like the central. Yeah. If, it, if it had been me, for example, and I really understood the technical economics of it. And, you know, you could have sat there and like spent a lot of political capital on like, we're going to get this right. We're going to completely revolutionize the American healthcare industry in a good way. We're going to liberate it. You know, we're going to go back to catastrophic insurance policies and we're not going to incentivize employers to cover third parties and blah, 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 blah. Like you could have done something, but it was so it, it came off in his first term under the Republicans. Like you're just going to repeal this thing. And then, and then what? No right. one knew. Nobody had a positive plan and they still don't. So still I don't, don't actually blame Trump. I blame the right and the policy people on the right for not having a unified, great plan for dealing with what has happened here. Um, they just don't know what to do. And yeah, and now, like you said, now that everyone's covered under these exchanges and all this stuff, if you pull the rug out from ever under everyone, it'll cause complete disaster. Yeah, so and some, it's really not fair. So, so now you to have be, to, yeah, you have to have a long term plan where you're transitioning out of it, and you know it's going to require a lot of thought. And unfortunately, like this is the stuff they should be focused on, not a call to the Ukrainian ambassador. Um, and that's what I think is pissing people off. While you know, you're like me where we're sitting here paying these enormous premiums and they're starting to cut things out of the policies every month. And my deductible is astronomical. So I'm spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this and not really getting anything for it. Yeah. And it's just going to get worse. I mean, this is not going to get better. No, it's going to get worse. And we're going to end up with single payer because nobody's got a solution. And the other thing he said in his speech is that so I guess what I'm saying is pre-existing conditions being always protected. I don't disagree with that, but I don't know what he means by that. And then he said, always protect Medicare and Social Security. I think that's also a mistake. Right. So, okay. And then I, I just want to play what he said here at 40 that's minutes. That's half of the government deficit. It's I just want to play um, what he also said about health care here at 40 minutes because, hang on. Here we go. To improve Americans' health care, there are those who want to take away your health care, take away your doctor, and abolish private insurance entirely. 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our health care system, wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. No, we're not very happy. <laughs> this, is, this is why I thought this was a mistake. I don't think he was strong enough about this. No. Um, no, we're not happy. Uh, 200 million Americans are really freaking unhappy. So this did not address what's going on out here. It's yeah. like he doesn't freaking know about it. Yeah, because now he's... He's in the position now of sort of defending the status quo from more socialist tinkering as opposed to being the outsider who's saying, hey, Obama, you and your cronies created an even more. No, but that's exactly what he should say. He should say that's exactly what he should say. They messed this up. It is so bad for you. And I know it. Obamacare has screwed up our our healthcare industry. 
And it was bad before. It had problems before. And now it's so much worse because of what was done. We haven't been able to get repeal and replace because, you know, when we need to do something. And these people want to make it even worse. And people need want to make it worse because they want to make it fully socialist. And we know how that ends. Yeah. I mean, he just could have said that and he didn't. Yeah. It was very weak. And he, he just, no, 200 million Americans are not freaking happy with their health insurance. Right. So that was like, whoa, what? No, yeah. that is totally that agree. is the total, it's out of touch. It's totally out of touch with what's going on out here. And it, it, it was bad. That was totally bad. Okay, so that was, and then the last thing I want to talk about is the last part of the speech when he basically just extolled American culture and I'm just going to play it uh, because it's just so awesome and we can talk about why this and by the way while you're queuing that up I think this is some a point where he could really lose the entire election to a Bernie type who could passionately avow some sort of government plan that's going to give everyone magical unicorn health care and sell a lot of people on it who are suffering yeah if we don't have a solution to people's pain. This is a real pain, a legitimate pain. And if we don't present a solution, if he doesn't present a solution, we are going to end up with socialized medicine. So that's my beef with that. I really was disappointed. I'm trying to get my phone to this exact number, 11754. <laughs> I can't. Fat thumbs. All right, here we go. Let's try this. We're almost there. Okay. <laughs> As the world bears witness tonight, America is a land of heroes. This is a place where greatness is born, where destinies are forged, and where legends come to life. This is the home of Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt, of many great generals, including Washington, Pershing, Patton, and MacArthur. This is the home of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, Harriet Tubman, the Wright brothers, Neil Armstrong, and so many more. This is the country where children learn names like Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett, and Annie Oakley. This is the place where the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth and where Texas Patriots made their last stand at the Alamo. That must be the Texas contingent clapping. Beautiful Alamo. (laughs) <laughs> the American nation was carved out of the vast frontier by the toughest, strongest, fiercest, and most determined men and women ever to walk on the face of the earth. I love Our that. Our ancestors braved the unknown, tamed the wilderness, settled the Wild West, lifted millions from poverty, disease, and hunger, vanquished tyranny and fascism, ushered the world to new heights of science and medicine, laid down the railroads, dug out the canals, raised up the skyscrapers, and ladies and gentlemen, our ancestors built the most exceptional republic ever to exist in all of human history, and we are making it greater than ever before. Okay, so he just listed Wyatt Earp, Davy Crockett, Thomas Edison, like all these people and heroes and talked about the frontiersmen and the wild west and the like this is america yeah and the appreciation for that which is our culture that's american culture right there it isn't some you know this is what separates us and i I was talking to somebody about this yesterday um america is the enlightenment values applied to a rugged, can do it, hardworking kind of people. Um, Unlike, you know, you you see in Britain, it's enlightenment values applied to, you know, a different culture. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I'm not saying there's anything bad about Britain. I actually really pre World War two, pre World War one, Britain is awesome. Um, and, And I love that history. And I love I love a lot about that country. But it's not, it's not America. It's not going to manifest like America. America is a specific place with a specific culture. And he just really described it there with a lot of imagery and just by naming people that we look at and think of as quintessential Americans. 
I thought that was a really great part of his speech. It it makes me go, yeah, that's he gets it. He gets my values. He gets what I appreciate about my country. People give him so much crap about his nationalism, but that is American nationalism is is what he listed and what he named. Yeah. And maybe his policies are not always right. But the people on the other side hate Wyatt Earp and Thomas Edison and Teddy Roosevelt and yeah. the frontier people who could do it and did anything without the government and the can-do rugged individualist. That's, they literally want to kill that person. That person won't let them be in control. Yeah, the cowboy. They want to tear that down. They hate it. It's their enemy. So Donald Trump appreciates the cowboy. They want to they want to get rid of the cowboy. And like I said, you know, he doesn't get every policy right. I don't like what he's doing about health care and so on. And I don't like the budget and all this stuff. I could criticize. But as you said earlier, we are in a fundamental battle here. It's Americanism versus that shit. And, you know, it may be, and we'll see in 2020, it may be that the country is divided. Um, I hope it's a landslide because that will give me hope that we can turn it around. If it's not a landslide, I think we're facing separation or some kind of civil war because it's just not, those two sides are not, you can't make it's a in, compromise. They're, they're incompatible. I mean. Fundamentally this, at odds. The, the union, you know, the union can't stand when you have, it was hard enough. I mean, this has been going on really since the founding of the country. There were people that wanted to break the union up within a few years after it was founded because, you know, for example, like Virginia was incompatible with the, the New Englanders. I mean, they kind of hated each other and they thought one side was trying to dominate the other. And, you know, this has been going on really since the founding of the country and it's only gotten worse and it's only gotten bigger. And I just, I, I don't think it should stand. I mean, I think at this point the union um, what are we in this for? Well, for um, sure, I California needs to get out. <laughs> yeah, there's just this. Look, we just have incompat. I mean, California. You know, think of like California, Alabama, North Carolina, and Massachusetts, and Michigan. I mean, these are just totally different places. And it would you know, work, it, except some of these places want to dominate the other places. So, I, I think it would be okay, except for what the other places are trying to do. But um, I think that's always going to, what I'm saying is just, I think it's in the nature yeah, that maybe so. you're always going to have factions. And I, I just, I think a country that that's this big no, with this You always have factions, but yes, what, what you I mean. don't always have with people who appreciate freedom is that they want to force their own, you know, agenda on you. Some yeah. of that, but like, Early days, there was at least a, a general appreciation for freedom, you know, on both sides, even among the North and South, you know. I mean, the problem with the South is, well, the North didn't want the South to do what it wanted, <laughs> I guess. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know enough about the history. Well, there was there was there was there was like people that really always have espoused a strong central government and like a yeah. a strong national government. And there's right. always been like Jeffersonians who have pushed back against it. And I I just think that we're at a stage now where um, culturally the sides are just it's oil and philosophically water. philosophically incompatible. You yeah. just can't. You can't have it stand, and I don't think it should stand. I mean, why should it? Well, um, we'll see, I, though. In 2020, if there's a landslide, you know, then you'll see that it's this kind of, it can change and the culture can change, and um, that that this radical leftist faction isn't as big as we think it is, you know, that it yeah, feels right. because they, they dominate the culture so much, the, the uh, media and Hollywood and everything. It just feels bigger than it is. I'm pretty sure. However, you know, I, I will find out. We'll find out in 2020 how big it really is because I think that they could not be more obvious about who they are and what they want at this point. So, you know, if you're voting for them, that's what you're picking. And it and it literally is going to destroy every, everything that has been great about this country, in my opinion. 
and create something new that you think will be better. Um, and I don't agree with that. And I don't want to live there. And I don't want my daughter to live there. So anyway, that's uh, that'll be an interesting election. I think um, I loved the ending. It spoke to me. It's probably spoke to a lot of other Americans. And that's why we like Trump. You know, the yeah. Americanism. It's not that he's right about everything or that he's not like he sucks on health care. And that to me is like my biggest one of my biggest issues. I free speech first, Second Amendment next. But after that, man, we got to fix health care. You know? Yeah. Um, I don't want it. Single payer health care will kill me, would have killed me already. Yeah. So it scares me. And I really need that fixed. And I don't see anybody doing anything about it. So that's scary. He's not doing anything about it. But I, you know what? I still support him because of the Americanism. So, yeah. And it's not a stupid anti-intellectual Americanism. I, just because he's saying wider, I, I don't know, you know, people on the right, the smarter ones like to sort of denigrate what he's done there. But in just those two paragraphs where he names all these people and he names the front, you know, talks about the frontier and he is talking about very deep culture, deep, deep inside us and what creates that American spirit and differentiates us from the rest of the world, regardless of where people came from to begin with. Um, so what I like about it is that it connects real people and it connects American ideals and American idealism with actual actors and people and hero heroic people throughout the country. In other words, he's not just platonically um, espousing some abstract form or ideal, you know, that we're supposed to pay allegiance to when you actually name characters from our past, it gives it reality and it, and it makes it more real. And it gives you the sense that, you know, you can do that too. And he, he characterized America as an adventure. He said, this is mm. part of the American adventure. I really like that yeah. term because it connotes risk and it connotes the risk that comes with being uh, an individual in a free country is that you have self-responsibility and that life is an adventure. It's not safe. Right. You know, you want it to be as safe as possible in terms of protecting you from other people's craziness. But um, the reality is that what we loved about what we love about our country is the risk takers and the fact that there's a certain amount of, you know, not with with responsibility is 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 also adventure and interest and excitement and the unknown. And that's part of what makes us a, a, a happy, benevolent people um, is that that's in front of us. Whereas, you know, people that live in cages are not happy people. <laughs> you know, they're safe. Maybe they're safe, um, quote unquote. But I don't want to be safe and live in a cage. I rather take some risk, <laughs> you know, and and live and and that sort of pioneering spirit is what he's tapping into, and I don't even think a lot of people on the right completely appreciate this, especially those you know when we've seen these people too, Sonny, like the kind of the I don't know abstract libertarian types, you know, I don't think they always connect with. True, like the real Americans, the yeah. cowboy, yeah, like. Yeah country music and the flag and rodeo. I mean, it doesn't have to be specifically cowboys, but I mean, it's all those things, you know, and, uh, the gun culture and, yeah. um, frontier culture, space exploration, Hunting, is part of it. space exploration. Yeah. Just going out and getting it done and, and self-responsibility and I don't and know, climbing mountains and stuff. like. I mean, yeah. that's American. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I really, and by the way, that is, could you be more different than Bernie Sanders in this regard? I mean, think of those people. Free like health care, free, free, free uh, college. All they think about when they think about America is we'll take care but, of you. 
and it's it's all just a, a morass of injustice yeah. and pain and yeah. suffering and and that is part of America's past too, but it's not the essence of 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 it. It's you know, it's overcoming those things and making it's, ourselves it it's, better. It's not that it doesn't exist, it's that we can get through it and and freedom is what what helps us get through it. So anyway, okay, well that's it for our show today. Thanks for listening. Uh, next week, we did have a special guest that we were going to have today, but she was sick, so she's going to come in next week. It's Kira Davis. We've had her on the show before. She's going to come on and talk about this crazy law that passed in California, and it matters to you because they're passing the same thing federally. So it basically banned all service self-employment. <laughs> so, <laughs> Other uh, than that, no big deal. Yeah, no big deal. And unbelievably i don't think that that's unconstitutional for them to have done this uh you know it's a state thing i don't know if the federal government can do it but um but yeah we'll talk about that next week with kira she's kind of been a local activist here in california on the issue and um highlighting that it's going federal and it's a really big deal they're trying to kill uber and it's a union kind of back thing and um so That'll be an interesting show, and she's always fun to have on. And so that's it for us today. Thanks for joining us. There is a house called the House of Sunny. It's filled with satire and fun. It's been the demise of bad ideas. Perspectives you may lack. It's concise and right and achieves world peace. Guaranteed.